and I understand you've also looked into the role genes play in people's behaviors and specifically violent behaviors as well. This is one that really caught me by surprise when I started doing research for my book because my brain wants to believe that if you commit violent misdeeds, um, that's all on you. Those are bad choices that you made. And my research into this topic was pretty eye-opening and it creates a far more complicated picture than I ever imagined. One of them is a genetic predisposition to aggression and violent behavior. So I'll tell you a quick story that made history. Bradley Waldrup was a man who was at home one evening waiting for his wife and kids to come home. When they did, she was, his wife was with a friend. They got into an altercation, an argument, and he shot her friend dead eight times right in front of the children. And then he told his own kids, say goodbye to mom, I'm going to kill her. He chased her around with a machete, chopped off one of her fingers. Luckily, she managed to escape, but Bradley Waldrop managed an escape of sorts as well because when he went to court, it was decided that he would be spared the death penalty because of his genes. Wow. How, how can you then look at their DNA and say, okay, the reason he did this is predetermined by his DNA, or at least he's set up for this behavior by his DNA, as opposed to external factors? That's a great question. He has a defective enzyme. It's called MAOA for those who are keeping track of these types of things. And this enzyme is deficient in clearing those neurotransmitters. So he gets a toxic buildup of neurotransmitters in the brain that makes it easy to become aggressive and lose impulse control and become violent. Some people carry that variation I spoke of and they wouldn't hurt a fly. Mm -hmm. But if they were abused as a child, mm -hmm. then the odds of them becoming violent go through the roof. And that's exactly what happened in Bradley Waldrup's mm -hmm. case. He had this genetic mutation and he was abused as a child as well. How soon are we gonna be able to control those genes, turn them on and off when necessary? There's, there's two answers to that question. Genes rarely do more than 40 to 60% of complex behaviors. The environment is a really key component. And I wrote an entire last chapter called Meet Your Future that talks about gene therapy, gene editing, how we might be able to fix genetic anomalies in individuals so they don't struggle with overeating, they don't struggle with addiction, mm -hmm. and they may not be as inclined to commit violent acts. I love how we're learning more and more about our DNA. I love that individuals like yourself are studying this, sharing it with us, but please do not listen to this and think that it doesn't matter at all if you're a parent, how you raise your child, no. how, how, you know, e even, the foods we eat and the way we behave, that, that affects our genetic expression, I think, but I, I love... I put it best, though, because you said that the environment, in an interview I read with you, actually is the volume knob on those genes, right? Like, you have these genes, but what is how you're brought up, your childhood, yeah. your environment, your diet, all of those things right. then adjust that volume and the likelihood of how much these genes will manifest, correct? Right. That's exactly right. The environment does treat our genes more like volume knobs. Mm -hmm. There are factors in the environment, both physical and even psychological, that can change whether a gene is turned on, off, or somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. The analogy that I like to use is that genes are like the piano keys, mm -hmm. but the environment plays the song. Rock on! Yeah. <laughs> Love it. And the beauty of this is I'm fascinated. I'm excited to read more about it. Everyone is going home with a copy of Bill's book. Please to meet me. I recommend everyone at home checking it out. Keep up the great work. Thank you very much.